Welcome back to the weightlifting.ai podcast. I am your host, Max Ada, and this, Giggle and Gibson, Joshua, the philosophical man himself. How are you doing today, Josh? I'm doing well. I just finished my cup of tea that you made. We've become British. As you can tell, we're in a, a standard British home. <laughs> and what you don't see is that they're all connected and it's just brick houses for yeah. miles and miles. Just got back from the pub. We did. We got fish and chips too. Yep. Uh, Gordon Ramsay's restaurant's down the road. <laughs> That's the extent of Josh's British knowledge. Uh, today we have a cool episode for you. We are going to cover the top mistakes that we think athletes make as far as we've seen in our experience. We're gonna try and share with you some of the things we've learned as coaches, as athletes ourselves, mm -hmm. basically going over those top things that you know we see as probably the biggest, most obvious low-hanging fruit that you could maybe look at as you're, as you're training and maybe I can knock this out or I can change my mindset and have some more success. So with that said, Josh, what would you say your first of this list is? Yeah, so I would say most people are familiar with the Pareto principle, which is the idea that 20% of, of, of work or 20% of something yields 80% of the results or 80% of the change. I would say athletes can tend to flip that and focus on a majority of stuff that yields the smallest results or the smallest change. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I love getting into the weeds. I love thinking about the nuance of, of the, the hand angle and the pull under the bar, or you know how high the hips are relative to the knee and, and what difference that would make with someone with stronger or weaker legs, and I do. But again, I think I've, I've been able to assimilate that into my thinking to where those decisions kind of get made as they rank in order of importance. I think with athletes, they don't have the ability to discern that and they tend to get a piece of information in and then apply it right away. So it's like, okay, my technique's super inconsistent. Uh, my PR is 100 kilos, but I can barely snatch 80 on a good day. Sometimes I can really pop off and get closer to 95, 98, but I'm really inconsistent. Technique's all over the place, but you know, if I turn my toes out this yeah. much and, 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 and use this dynamic start, that's gonna make the difference. Um, it's like a hyper focus on the details, thinking that all the little details are the thing that add up to the big progress, when the reality is that, uh, you know, probably most of those things will end up ironing themselves out or just have such a small impact that's right. that, you know, the energy and time that goes into focusing on those details may take away from that energy being better invested in the bigger things that are actually, you know, driving progress. Yeah, yeah, right. Because you can't technical change your way out of a bad right. program, and you can't program your you you can't necessarily program your way to the most efficient technique. Now you can you can use great exercise selection, you can use the correct weights, but if your execution on the program is just not very great, right? You don't pay attention, you don't really care too much, you're sloppy, you're not deliberate, you're kind of distracted all the time. The execution is not going to be in alignment with the quality of the work. So again, what you end up applying is going to yield such a small result that it it, it can feel like it's it's a waste, right? And that's when people kind of you just start to give up or start yeah. to get defeated. So I think being able to execute on the big bedrock ideas of we know you got to keep the bar close, you got to get a good position at the top, a good position at the bottom. A lot of the other stuff kind of works itself out, um, and then you have programming to support that where it follows you know phasic structure, it's higher volume, lower intensity, more technical focus that changes over time. Um, and it's integrated with individual factors to make sure it's unique to you and, and what you need so that you can yield the 80% from the 20%. Yeah, I would say the number one for me is definitely uh, communication. It's the ability to communicate with your coach, to be honest with yourself, to be honest about your assessments. So communication comes down to uh, you know the things you do, you interpret them so you do a training session your training block whatever it is you communicate with your coach as to what it is that was working what wasn't working your feelings
feelings about those things uh, because that's really the only tools they have other than visual observation to make any real changes to your training, right? Or to guide you. The way you talk to your coach, the way you communicate with them, the rapport you build is one of the biggest mm. sort of um, yeah. barometers they can use to make adjustments for you. A coach knows you, they'll learn you, they'll learn your, your strengths and weaknesses, they'll learn your personality. And when they see those things kind of shifting and moving awry, they can make an adjustment to the program. People oftentimes don't communicate honestly with with coaches and with themselves. And the first part, they don't communicate honestly with coaches in that they believe they can answer the coach in the way they think the coach wants the answer. So they would say to you, you know, if a coach asks, how did you feel? The athlete might interpret that and say, oh, uh, he wants me to say I feel good. Because mm -hmm. if I don't say I feel good, right. he won't let me go heavy. And if I don't go heavy, I won't get better because going heavy is what makes me get better. And so, you know, you're, you're trying to basically manage the entire you're, you're managing yourself and you're managing the coach and you're trying to manage all that stuff and it's just going to be a, a, a disaster in the end. So honest communication with your coach. Be open, be honest. You can tell them you don't feel good and the coach might just adjust the weights and you can say, hey, I'd rather go heavier. And the coach might give you a, uh, you know, a scenario where, okay, well, if you hit X, Y, and Z, then we can go above that. So be honest with your coach. The second is communicating with yourself. It's the way you talk to yourself and the honesty you have to have with that. It's very easy as an athlete to get into a place where you think that uh, you've decided, you know what the answers are, mm. and you're gonna just, it's, I gotta do these things, right? Uh, and you might actually have really just sort of segmented part of the things that you really wanna do from the things that you know you should do and decided that that's the answer. So this looks like a situation where maybe someone, you know, as an athlete, they, they are choosing to only do certain exercises or only emphasize certain things or they skip out on, on you know, accessories, or they skip out on sleep, or they skip out on these other things. They don't execute on those things, but then they tell themselves that they're doing a good job mm. because they come in and they train hard and they do the big lifts and they do those things. And so it's this bubble you put yourself in where the lies you're sort of maybe just ignoring, the, the way you're kind of dishonest with your own training and the, your, your own stuff, creeps in and eventually you you know you look back on it and you're like well I didn't do all those things but I kept telling myself I was going to get better because I was doing the things that you know were on the page or most of the things that are on the page this is a problem because one, if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with anyone else. So that's a, a huge problem. But it just creates a situation of like a trap door where you can keep going along doing things fine and it seems great. And then when all those little details you skipped, all those little things you didn't you know, adhere to start to add up, it just, the bottom falls out and you end up showing up to meet, maybe you're way underweight, maybe you're not rested, maybe on the heavy training days you just perform really poorly because all those other factors were just neglected. So. Super important that your communication with your coach is honest, communication with yourself is honest, and that you're doing a great job of, of that communication. You're thorough, you're exact, you're concise. You use a common glossary between yourself and your coach, and when you write things down, you give detailed information so that when you look back on it, you can say, oh, you know, May 1st, 2018, I hit this lift, uh, and I felt this way. May, you know, May 1st, 2022, I had this lift and felt this way, you know that those two things are on the same page, the same verbiage, the same wording is used. Yeah, and I think when you view like coachability as a skill, as an athlete, you can start to develop your ability to be coached. And I think, speaking from personal experience, I did a, probably a, a worse job at this earlier and a better job now. When people are hard to coach, right, they, they don't give feedback, they don't talk, they don't interact, they don't really acknowledge you much, they kind of do their own thing, it's hard to get as invested in that yeah. that's that relationship as much as it is with people who are talkative, they, they tell you what you need to know, they're super involved, they're interested and curious, it, it makes it fun and collaborative. So if you find that you're on one end of the spectrum, it's like you're either doing a good job at being coachable or a not as good job, you can see it as a skill to develop instead of, well, this is how I am or who I am, therefore, I'm going to struggle. It's like, okay, I could do a better job of being proactive with my my uh, my feedback. I do a, do a good job being proactive with what I need or what I want. I can ask the coach, like, hey, what do you expect from this session? What do you expect from me? And I think having that coachability and the communication there is, is massive. Uh, the second mistake I would say for, for athletes is not being able to shift perspectives 
So being hyper focused on the present or hyper focused on the future yeah. of at this meet I want to do X numbers. And, and to uh, Max's point, it's like, well, how do you get there? It's making these small decisions that add up over time and allow you to realize it. Or you get so caught up in a training session that it's, I need to hit this number today. And you're really trying to force lifts and you're trying to force a technique, or you're trying to force a change, or you get so caught up in it being good or bad that you feel like that dictates your future. Or you get so caught up in it being you know, not that meaningful that you don't allow it to dictate your future. So it's this ability to shift perspective, realize that it's not all now or all later, it's an integration and it's a balance and it's, it's kind of figuring out when you can exploit it and, when you can exploit the pl the present or when you can exploit the future and taking advantage of that versus being all in on one regardless um, and, and kind of rigid in that way. Yeah, I, that's a, a great point. I would say for me, the second one is definitely uh, establishing expectations, but that kind of goes hand in hand with like establishing uh, a, a plan, right? Have an exit plan. Uh, with that in mind, the idea is that you've got like, okay, I'm going to be a weightlifter. I want to do weightlifting. You fall in love with it. You just come to the gym all the time. You can't get enough of it. You watch it every dinner, every every spare minute you have. You're just obsessed with it. Uh, but give yourself a chance to actually have a, a, a sort of bigger picture look and say, where do I expect myself to be? after this next competition, what would be a great result for me in a realistic sense at a internet, uh, sorry, a American Open meet, a national level meet, whatever, what can I do along that course to build a career for myself as a weightlifter? And then what does it look like you know, as far as what am I planning and thinking about to be the end of my career, or maybe maybe tapering off or retiring the end of that. That might be 10 years down the road, it doesn't have to be something definitive, but understand that you have to have this course of action that's, I'm going to train, I'm gonna compete and improve my performance time and time again. When I get to a certain level and I feel like I've achieved some of the things I'm looking to achieve, I need to think about what is it that I'm gonna do after that. Am I gonna to move to coaching? Am I just gonna retire? Uh, you don't wanna to get to a place where you train for years, you get really good, uh, or maybe you don't get so good, and you just kind of get forced out of the sport because of an injury or because of these things, and you didn't set up anything to sort of give yourself a chance to continue to love the sport and continue to enjoy it, continue to be around it in a sense that's positive to you. If you just kind of let everything go and you sort of like overstay your welcome, uh, you're gonna be in a place where it just feels like shit afterward and at the end of it, you're gonna either resent everyone around you or resent people for failed opportunities or missed chances or you're gonna be just miserable about the sport because mm -hmm. you didn't actually set yourself up to understand that there's an arc to this, there's an up and a down and an end to it that you should be aware of. Doesn't mean every single day you need to walk in the gym thinking, when am I retiring? But have an idea that like, look, what level do I think I can actually achieve? I'm gonna to train to do that, see if I can hit these numbers and have a steady you know, march towards those, that progress and then to that point, decide from there what I should do and then think about you know what I want to do on the back end of that as an athlete or a coach. Yeah, there's actually a really interesting exercise that uh, therapists will use to help people determine what they, they value in life and what they ultimately want to do or how to direct their actions, which is imagine someone speaking at your funeral and, and giving some sort of eulogy uh, for your life. And I guess as an athlete, that could hold as well. Is that, like, like, is that like if you read the obituaries looking for your name and you don't see it, <laughs> it's fucking go time? It is go time. But if you do see it, that speaks to something metaphysical about the world. Yeah. Um, if you do see it, it's done time. <laughs> it's done over. Uh, but you, that's actually a really interesting idea I never thought of uh, that Max brought up is like, think about what you want to accomplish, what that looks like, how you know you've done that. And, and again, it doesn't have to be very delineated numbers or uh, competitions, but it's like, I wanna show up and train consistently. I wanna hold myself to a high standard. I wanna make sure the people around me are elevated as well. And if you don't wanna do that and you say, I just wanna show up and clang and bang, max out all the time and, and hit whatever numbers I can as fast as possible, like that's a strategy too. Because you have to realize that like. Well, yeah. that's, that's a, that's a behavior, right? Yeah. I think the, the, the key is that the strategy is if you define what you want to achieve, all of your actions can be measured against that. Right. So if you come in and you're like, I wanna be a little bit champion, but you train twice a week, yeah. like 
there's a discrepancy between that and you know. But if you're like, I just want to have fun, then it's very easy to make yeah. decisions, you know. Yeah, and, the, and those things can be more or less broad, right? Like yeah. having fun is different from. I'd like to get to the highest level in weightlifting that I can possibly get to. Yeah. And, and while that's open ended, you know, it, it's more certain than having fun, yeah, which, yeah. which can change quite a bit. And it can be a little bit more kind of volatile. Um, so I guess kind of having this like retrospective feel for what do you want to accomplish? How do you want to accomplish it? And what are the things along the way that set that up yep. uh, is actually an interesting way to approach it. Yeah. I would say maybe one more for myself. Uh, would just be, you know, think about sustainability, create a long-term plan. So that looks like, you know, obviously your coach and you're going to decide this, but, you know, from a yearly perspective, like take some time to, you know, remove the constant beating of training and, and pressure of competing at competitions as competition schedule allows for. It, it's a beneficial thing to take a tiny step back here and there, you know, and give yourself an off season for a month or something uh, to where you can take a vacation, you can do those things, you don't feel that pressure of I have to do this over and over again. I don't think I've ever seen an athlete that, that, only, that like if they had not trained every single week of the year wouldn't have gotten to the level they got to. Yeah. Um, for sure, I've never seen that at, in either sport, powerlifting or weightlifting. So definitely it sounds amazing to do that, but you know, the other side of that coin is that like, you know, it, we, we hear these stories a lot about like, you know, people training seven days a week, Michael Phelps, right? Swam seven days a week to get the extra training in. Um, we don't know exactly what those yeah. sessions were. Was he just swimming in the pool as active recovery? Was he doing things? But from the perspective of create a manageable, sustainable plan that, that doesn't burn you out twice as fast is a huge, a huge thing. I would definitely recommend that as an athlete, you give yourself time throughout the year that you plan to step away from weightlifting enough that you start to rekindle some motivation for it and love for it and you know, it keeps you excited about the sport as well as giving you a chance to heal things and, and just take a break you know, here and there so you don't get you know, overly burned out on it. Yeah, I think the last thing I would say, the last mistake is having an inflexible approach to yeah. all of this stuff changing over time, right? So you start off, you have a, a, an idea of what you want to do, how you want to do it, and, and how you execute on the plan or how you execute the plan. And then when things start to change, there's an inflexibility of like, oh, well, I can't do it differently. Um, and the reality of it is, as you mature, as you spend more time in the sport, like maybe you transition more to coaching and, and less to being an athlete. And you still compete, but coaching seems to take more of a priority. And it's like being okay, okay with that happening or the inverse. It's like, actually, I really want to compete at a high level that doesn't make sense with coaching full time. Um, so maybe I wait to transition to being a coach or maybe I wait to transition out of the sport or I make these decisions based on what the current circumstance is dictating, not what I feel the previous circumstance dictates. And I think a lot of this is having this responsive attitude, being open to incoming information, but having some sort of framework in place by which you can operate and move to an ultimate end, not just you kind of make decisions based on the day to day. Yep. Well, any final thoughts? I mean, uh, this is stuff, you know, I've thought about because these are mistakes that I've made. I know. And I think, every, <laughs> and then I think everyone probably will make or will go through. Uh, so for us, it's, it's like a reminder. And then this like gentle nudge of like, just consider this stuff when you think about your training, future training or past training. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Josh. That is it for us at the Wayofting.ai podcast. If you are interested in uh, contacting either of us, you can find me and my remote coaching options at teamada.com. You can find me on Instagram, max underscore ada. If you're interested in getting the best weightlifting training app there is, check out Wayofting.ai. It's an amazing program. We adjust everything, all the variables. It's a completely individualized program. You're going to get a program that's very different from someone else. The more you do it, the more it's going to change and adapt to you. It's extremely customizable as well. If you want to change the number of days you train a week, the exercises you want to use, all sorts of things. So go ahead and check it out. There is a two week trial promo code you can use to get two weeks free on your first month and see if it's right for you. Josh, where can they find you? Yeah, so Max and I did uh, put together a book recently. You can find that at weightliftinghouse.com. It's a book all about the snatch. So you can take the ideas, exercises, concepts, and integrate it into the weightlifting AI and actually modify your program to suit your specific technical needs 
if you feel like there are some changes within the book that make sense for you. Uh, you can find me at philosophicalweightlifting.com, on Instagram at josh underscore philwl, and on onyxstraps.com and weightlifting weightliftinghouse.com. Uh, you can use the code philwl for 10% off, and that all supports everybody. That's it, Mus. Mm-hmm.